All right, welcome back to our video series on global temperature variability. So in the last video, we talked about the causes of global temperature change and the actual physics behind uh, why temperature should change. And uh, we talked about forced versus unforced variability. And we are gonna use that information now to assess uh, the so-called pause in global warming and to try to um, figure out what's actually going on with current temperature, te temperature trends. So um, when we talk about the pause in global warming, what are we actually talking about? So here I'm graphing uh, temperature change from 1996 to 2013. Um, and these are three different estimates of how the global temperature uh, has changed over that time. So the black line, that's an estimate from NASA, and that's essentially weather stations compiled from across the surface of the planet, uh, averaged together to get the global temperature. Um, there's another estimate from weather stations, which comes from the United Kingdom's Hadley Center, which is essentially their National Weather Service. And then the red line is an estimate of global temperature from satellite observations. And I'm showing three different estimates just to kind of show that um, you can calculate global temperature in different ways, but overall uh, you still kind of get the same ups and downs and the same uh, short-term trends in temperature. So when you look at all three of these and you look at the temperature change over, say, the past 11 years and you draw kind of a straight line or you fit a linear trend uh, over that time period, what you get is a flat line. So essentially there's been no increase in global surface temperature over the past 10 years. And that is uh, basically true to, no matter what uh, data set you're looking at. And so this is the actual pause in global temperature. So the first thing that we need to note when we're talking about this pause in global temperature is that it's not so apparent when we actually zoom out a little bit. So in this graph now, I've zoomed out from the year now 20, or 1900 to 2013, and I'm still showing the same um, subplot here where we have uh, 1996 to 2013. And now I'm gonna add in the temperature uh, changes from 1900 up to 1996. And now we see that the so-called pause in global temperature is not necessarily so apparent. It's not so obvious in the data now. And in fact, if we fit straight lines from 1978 uh, to 2013 in all three of these data sets, uh, it's really not apparent that the warming um, recently has been doing anything other than following this long-term trend. So all of a sudden, the pause kind of disappears when we zoom out uh, to this level. And we can zoom out even further and make this point more explicitly, where now I'm showing um, temperature from the year 500 to the year 2013, and I still have this box around the pause up here. And so I'm gonna let that go. And uh, so reconstructing temperatures back to the year 500 isn't done with weather stations, it's done with um, what we call temperature proxies like tree rings or corals or lake sediments or stalactites, things like this can tell us um, how temperatures have changed in the past. And basically what we see is that um, there was a period when it was a little warmer, which is often called the medieval warm period, and then a period when it was a little cooler, which is often called the little ice age. Um, but the recent increase in temperature really dwarfs these um, natural variations that we've seen. And again, the pause, the so-called pause in temperature when seen in this context uh, is hardly anything. And we may still, you know, uh, expect the temperature to go up much, much more. And I'll just put on here um, where, when the Industrial Revolution happened, when we started putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, which we learned in the last video causes an energy imbalance and thus causes the temperature to increase. Uh, this is when the Industrial Revolution happened. And so it's um, totally within our expectations that we would have a large increase uh, in temperature after we started uh, changing the energy balance uh, in the atmosphere. Okay, so that was the first point about the pause, is to, um, when you zoom out and you look at it in a longer time context, it does not seem nearly as impressive or long as it may look when you're just looking at the past decade or so. Uh, the second point about the pause is to bring back in uh, the conversation we had before about forced and unforced variability. So I'm zooming back in now to the years uh, 1880 to 2013. And so these are our observational temperatures. And what I'm going to do now is just average all three of these together just to get one line and clean up the plot. 
And so remember in the last video we talked about that the temperature that we actually observe is forced plus unforced variability. And if you remember, the forced variability is the movement of the man, uh, things like increasing greenhouse gases, where the unforced variability um, is things like is the movement of the dog, and that's things like El Ninos or La Ninas, which can cause short-term uh, changes in temperature. And so what we want to know is how much of this variability, how much of the temperature change over different time periods is actually forced due to things like greenhouse gases, and how much of it is unforced due to natural changes like El Ninos. And so in order to do that, what, we, what scientists use are global climate models. So all global climate models are, are using math and physics to calculate um, temperature change. That's, that's what they do. And global climate models can um, be very simple. They can be as simple as a single equation. So this is a global climate model. And uh, if you remember from the last video, we said that global temperature changes when there's an energy imbalance. And that's all this equation says. It says global temperature changes. Uh, when there's an energy imbalance. So this is very simple. It's so simple you can <clears throat> uh, easily run this climate model on Excel and do your own um, global temperature projections out into the future. Um, but scientists also maybe want to add a lot more complexity and try to simulate a lot more features of the Earth's climate. And so there's models that get a lot more complex than this single equation. There's models that involve tens of thousands of equations and try to simulate uh, climate in all sorts of regions across the world. And in those climate models, um, they're, they're so computationally expensive, they use so much computer power that they're usually run on supercomputers at uh, you know, national labs or at agencies like NASA. So um, the point here is that you need to use a climate model to try to figure out what part of the temperature change is forced and what part is unforced. And you can use a variety of different climate models to do that. So when we use climate models to figure out what is the force variability, this is essentially what it looks like. So the blue line is the force variability. This is the movement of the man. And the force variability, remember, is changes that are imposed on the ocean atmosphere system. So something to point out here is there's um, some spikes, some downward spikes in temperature like here, 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 here. Um, so we have five major kind of down um, movements of temperature. And what these are, these are major volcanic eruptions. And so these are in the force component of temperature change because when a volcano goes off, it puts a bunch of ash into the atmosphere and reflects the sun and uh, causes an energy imbalance in the atmosphere. Um, and that was imposed on the ocean atmosphere system. The ocean atmosphere system didn't create that by itself. So that gets put into this blue line, the movement of the man. Okay, so concerning the pause in global temperature, the question that we want to ask now is, is it strange that temperatures recently have not increased as fast as the blue line, the forced component of temperature change, would say that they should have? So we have this difference between where we actually are in terms of observations <clears throat> and where we essentially should be in terms of the forced component of temperature change. We want to know how strange that is. Well, in order to answer that question, we need to know how long is the leash. When we go back to the man you know, versus walking his dog analogy, we need to know how long the leash is to see how far away the observed temperature change can get away from the forced temperature change. Or in other words, how far can the dog get away from the man? So in order to do that, we can uh, again run computer models or global climate models to try to figure out how long the leash is. So you can imagine um, walking your dog once and then going back to the very um, start of your walk and walking it again. And so you are going to walk on the same path, the man walks on the same blue path, where the dog can walk uh, on a different path. It may be totally, a totally new random path the second time around. So that's what this is showing, is we can use a computer model to go back in time and run the climate again with the same increase in greenhouse gases, the same volcanic eruptions, the same forced variability, and see how the temperature evolution might be different. And you can run that same climate model again and again, and you can run it a hundred times. And now what you're seeing is 
a hundred different paths of the dog while the man used the or while the man walked the exact same path. So in every single time, uh, the man walked on the blue line and the dog walked on a different random path. And so by looking at the hundred different paths of the dog, we can see how long the leash is. And we can see that the current observations of temperature, the black line, uh, have stayed within the length of the leash, just as we would expect. And even recently, uh, temperatures are not increasing as fast as we might expect, given how much greenhouse gases have increased. But given how long the leash is, it's actually not that surprising that you would get a decade like this. So earlier in the record, we saw there was a large um, increase in temperature that was not all due to greenhouse gases. And a big part of that looks like it was due to the randomness of the dog. It looks like the dog just happened to move from um, below where the man was to above where the man was. Um, and physically, that would mean that uh, there was the ocean atmosphere system itself created an energy imbalance that caused its own temperature to increase. Um, so a side note here is we can also use computer models to ask the question, what if humans never increased greenhouse gases? So that means instead of going back in time and changing um, the path of the dog or letting the dog go on another random path, this is where we go back in time and we change the forced component or we actually change the the path of the man. And so that's what this purple line is. This is the new path of the man without increasing greenhouse gases. And then the green lines are a hundred different paths of the dog, a hundred different unforced variability um, possibilities uh, without increasing greenhouse gases. And so we see that where temperatures are, where the observed temperatures are, the black line, is far outside of where they possibly could be. Uh, if we never increased greenhouse gases. Okay, so over the past decade, um, it hasn't warmed quite as fast as we would have expected based on um, how much greenhouse gases have increased. But given the length of the leash um, and looking at you know how, the envelope, how large uh, changes in temperature possibly could have been in the in the past given the length of the leash, it's it's basically inevitable that we'll get decades like this where temperatures don't increase as fast as we expect them to. And then it's inevitable that we'll have decades where then it increases much faster than we expect, just based on the randomness of the movement of the dog or the randomness of unforced variability. And we can zoom out and give this more context going into the future where um, we expect the man to go based on how much greenhouse gases are expecting to uh, increase in the future, where there's a lot of uncertainty as to how much greenhouse gases will actually emit. And we see again that um, the disagreement here actually doesn't seem that great. And it's within the envelope of, of uh, unforced variability that we've just been talking about. And then we can zoom out even further and look at um, the year 500 to the year 2100. And <clears throat> again, see that the recent pause in global warming um, is within the length of the leash. And it's not too surprising that um, that we might get decades like that, but it's um, rather dramatic how large the temperature increases um, are based on the path of the man over time periods like this. So the summary of the three videos basically go like this. We talked about how local temperature is not global temperature and what actual global temperature um, means and how you can get uh, temperature variability at any given location that may be very different than the global average. Uh, we talked about how global temperature changes and that it all has to do with an energy imbalance um, being imposed on the atmosphere or an energy imbalance being created um, by the ocean atmosphere system itself. Uh, we talked about how unforced variability uh, dominates uh, variability in the short term. So from year to year and from decade to decade, the movement of the dog, the randomness of the movement of the dog is really what you're seeing on those short time scales. But when you zoom out to longer time scales, say 100 years, uh, the movement of the man um, really becomes much more apparent. Um, the global warming pause is not very dramatic when we zoom out to longer time scales. So if you just look at the past 10 years, it's true that temperatures have not increased. But if you zoom out to even from 1978 to 2013, uh, the pause is not very apparent at all in that data. 
And when you zoom out even further, um, you know, back to the year 500, then the pause basically, you know, disappears. So if you give it more context, if you look at the longer term warming, uh, the pause is not very dramatic. And then it's true that warming is happening slower than expected over the past decade, but given how long the leash is, given um, that we have unforced random variability in the climate system, uh, decades like this are inevitable. And it's inevitable that we'll have decades that it'll warm much faster than we're expecting uh, due to greenhouse gases as well.